Well, a good morning to uh, each and every one of you present with us uh, this morning. Easter Friday is always a cherished day on the calendar in the lives of uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this website video presentation from Bethel Baptist Church in Fergus. My name is Pastor Snell, and I'm delighted to join with our technician this morning, as well as our speaker a little later on, Mr. John Bennett. We're going to enjoy a wonderful Easter Friday service together, and I trust that you'll be able to join with us for the entire time together. We're very glad that you've chosen to join us as we worship the one who laid down his life for us on Calvary's cross. He paid the only price that could be paid for our sin, and it was a substitutionary death for us on Calvary that gave to us the only means by which we could have our sins forgiven and know eternal life. We thank God for our Lord and Savior, and it's in his name today that we worship and praise him for all that God has done for us as the people of God. It's also a privilege to uh, share with you just by way of ministry update this morning. Uh, we will be enjoying an Easter Sunday service, and we would just trust that you would uh, make yourself available for that time on Sunday morning. It's Resurrection Sunday morning, always another great time in the life of a church family like this. And then secondly, we want to remind you of our Wednesday night uh, prayer time. Uh, we have a Zoom connection, and uh, if perhaps you have not been joining us and you would like to, and you don't know how to connect with us, just call the church office or contact the church office by email, and we'll make sure that we pick up those messages and get you the information that you'll need. That's for this coming Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. And then uh, we would uh, just really appreciate or express our appreciation to you for your faithful giving to the work of the Lord. This is a challenging time for churches all over our country, and uh, we thank God for those of you who are helping uh, so well in seeing that the uh, ministry financial needs are met here at Bethel. Uh, we announced uh, last week that we had a couple of our ladies that were preparing to give birth to children. We're very pleased to report to you that on Monday evening, Jude Elliot Osborne was born to the Burns family, and this is Paul and Laura Burns, and uh, Mother Laura and baby are progressing well. There had been uh, some difficulties uh, just after the delivery with little Jude, but he's being treated, and at this time, uh, we're glad to report that things seem to be going well. And this is a wonderful blessing for our Bethel Baptist Church family and to the entire Burns family. And we also want to tell you that this is a brother for little Bo. And so this is two sons for the Burns, and we just really rejoice in that news. Well, I've been asked by our brother John Bennett to read some verses of Scripture from Matthew chapter 27. If you have your Bibles with you, I trust that you would turn to that passage of Scripture, Matthew 27, and I'll begin at verse number 22, and uh, I'll go down, all the way down to verse number 50. So just listen as we read together. Pilate said to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What, what evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, he washed his hands before the multitude, and he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate released uh, Barabbas unto them, and when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him, and they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, 
They put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own clothing on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation, written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, You that destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel... Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard this, that said, this man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let it be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. What a blessing it is on this Good Friday to read the word of God, and especially at this very significant time in our lives as the people of God. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, with great thanksgiving in our hearts, we bow humbly in your presence, expressing gratitude today for all that your death accomplished for us some 2,000 years ago. How good that we have a God today who kept his word. He enacted his plan before the foundation of the world and saw it come to fruition in the person of of his Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless and praise you for the joy of sins forgiven to, for all those who have placed their personal faith in Christ for eternal life. We're thankful, Lord, that we have a sure salvation today, that our eternal life is secure in Christ Jesus, the one who gave his all for us, on that horrendous day on Calvary. And yet, Lord, it secured our eternal redemption. And so we thank and praise you for our gathering here together at this very special time in the life of the believing body of Christ. And Lord, today we do want to bring before you our church family, thanking and praising you for each and every one, some, I'm sure, continue to struggle at this time in light of all that has transpired over this past month. And I'm just praying, Lord, that you would bring your peace and comfort and calm to each and every heart. Thank you for God's word. 
Thank you for the wonderful privilege of prayer. And Lord, we rejoice that we can reflect back upon many times of fellowship together as the people of God at Bethel Baptist. And we look forward to the day, the Sunday, that we can come back together and enjoy your presence and fellowshipping with one another. We thank you for the healthy delivery of little Jude to the Burns family. We know, Lord, that he's gone through some days of challenge, and I'm praying, Lord, that you would continue to minister your touch upon his little body. And, Lord, grant your blessing to the Burns family and to the entire Bethel Church family in these days. What a joy to welcome this little one into our church family and into the Burns family. And so, Lord, we pray that as our brother John Bennett ministers God's word this morning that you would especially bless his ministry. Lord, give us listening ears and obedient hearts to receive from you that which you would desire us to have today. And Lord, we be careful to praise you and thank and praise you today for all that you are to us. And we give you the praise and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I first met John Bennett and his wife many years ago down in a little town called Simcoe, where I was pastoring, and uh, he was at that time with the Faith Mission in Canada. He's had a rich history with this uh, mission organization. We're grateful for his ministry in our lives as a Bethel Baptist church family over these number of years. John's ministry with the Faith Mission has mightily been used of God, and he continues to have a connection with them. He's a man of prayer. He's a man of the word, and we're privileged to invite him here today to share with us the word of God. John, may you be blessed richly. I know our hearts will be as you minister today. Well, thank you very much, Pastor. It's a real privilege to share with you folks today over this uh, broadcast. Uh, we're glad that you have joined with us to worship the Lord, and on this Good Friday morning, what a privilege it is to gather together just to rejoice in God's presence. And as the pastor has read that wonderful story again of that first Good Friday, uh, what a challenge it is to all our hearts, and a reminder again of God, what God did for us. Thinking about this morning and what God would have me share, uh, I was reminded of a couple of things that happened in the Old Testament. And I was reminded of the plagues in Egypt and what God did through that time when the children of Israel were led out of bondage. God sent those plagues for at least two good reasons. And if you look into the scriptures, and we're not going to do that today, but you'll find that God wanted, first of all, to demonstrate and to underline the fact that he is Lord. And we know that is true. He wanted Israel to know he was Lord. He wanted the Egyptians to know that he is Lord. And he also wanted to deliver his people from the bondage and slavery that they were in. And then I was reminded of 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 of what happened in the life and experience uh, of Israel in the days of Elijah. And you'll remember again how God visited his people with a famine. And for three years they suffered from that famine. And God took Elijah with, uh, and in, asked, he invited Ahab and Israel up Mount Carmel. And he had a twofold purpose, at least in mind. One was, of course, that God wanted through all of this to underline the seriousness of sin. And the other, at least, was that God wanted again to underline that he is Lord. And we find the people falling on their faces and acknowledging that he is the Lord. Now, uh, I don't know what you're thinking as I shared that, and we're living in momentous days today. We're living in the midst of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and we could be asking ourselves, you know, what you think is the reason for this? Is this just some unfortunate freak of nature? Is it someone's fault, a doctor, a, an individual, a government's fault? Whose fault is it? Or is this a time when God wants to awaken all of us to our 
need of him as Lord and Savior, to remind us that he is indeed the Lord, and also to remind us that we're all vulnerable. Age, religion, nationality, social standing, none of these things uh, come into the picture because all are in the same boat and all are vulnerable. Now, it's not my purpose this morning to attempt even to begin to answer these questions on this Good Friday morning, but I do want to turn our attention to another momentous occasion, something that happened that not only impacted the world for a year or two years or three years, but has impacted the world for over 2,000 years. The uh, being, of course, the death uh, of Jesus Christ. And I want to tr invite you to join with me to explore at least three questions or four questions this morning as to uh, this Easter story, surrounding the Easter story. We all know the story so well, and I really don't need to go into the details of it all. Of course, it began uh, in, in Bethlehem with the birth of a little baby, and then Jesus grew up, and through his lifetime, he did many miracles. He sought to help wherever he, he went. He taught the people, and we find that the ministry and life of Jesus impacted many, many, many people. Thousands were fed, dead were raised, sick were healed, and so on. And then one day, and we celebrated this last Sunday, one day he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And as he rode into that city on both sides of the road were crowds and crowds of people singing his praises, filled with an expectancy. Here is the new king going into Jerusalem and he's going to deliver Israel and set them free from the uh, rule of the Roman Empire. Only about a week later, we find that all of them have forsaken him and fled. They have all gone and left him. And we find him in that mock trial that was read for us this morning. We find him being led out to be crucified, having been brutally treated and left there to die amongst those criminals. Question number one, why was this necessary? Why was this necessary? Could he not have accomplished a lot more by going into Jerusalem that day, by taking a seat of authority in the government, and by ruling in righteousness, by teaching the people and, and, and all of that? Could he not have accomplished a whole lot more? Why was it necessary that he should die? Well, you see, the problem and the answer to that question is in the problem. The problem was that it was not the, the, the one who rules the world that was the problem, but it's the one who rules the heart. And we find that the Bible declares that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 is a well-known verse. The Bible declares that there is none righteous, no, not one. And uh, the, the, this is the reason uh, that Nobody has to be taught how to do evil. Nobody has to be taught how to do wrong. We have all sinned. We've all been born with that inherited sinful nature, going right back to the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned against God and what we term as the fall took place. And so why was this necessary? It was necessary because the problem is in the heart of mankind and the problem is our sin made it necessary. A second reason why it is necessary is because our sin has separated us from God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, your sins and your iniquities have separated between you and God. And the reason why it was necessary for Jesus to die was because we were all sinners and our sin has brought about a separation between us and our God. And thirdly, the Bible declares that the wages or the punishment for sin is death. The Bible tells us in, in uh, Romans 6, uh, 23, the wages of sin is death. Now, I'm sure m most, if not all of us who are adults, 
have uh, worked at some time for an employer, and we expect to get wages. And the Bible tells us that the wages for our sin, your sin and my sin, is death. That's not just physical death, although that comes into it, but it's spiritual death, separation from God, removal from God. The Bible says our sins and our iniquities have separated between us and God. So why was it necessary? Because of our sin. Because the Bible declares our sin separates from God. And the Bible declares that the punish from punishment for sin is death. And a third reason is that in order for our sins to be forgiven, in order for us to receive pardon, the wages have to be paid. The punishment has to be meted out. Who's going to pay the wages? Who's going to receive the punishment? Well, if I receive the punishment for my sin, then uh, it means death, separation from God eternally. And so who's going to do it? There's only one. And we know we're celebrating his death today. And it's Jesus because he was the only sinless person that ever lived. He was the only one who could die for the sin of another. There's a hymn writer that wrote a hymn, I believe she was the wife of a bishop from Londonderry in Northern Ireland, and she wrote this hymn. There is a green hill far away, outside a city wall. And one line of that hymn goes on to say, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate and let us in. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 53 and verse 6 that all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He paid the price so that you and I could be set free. I have shared this little illustration before here at Bethel, but I remember hearing a story, actually, when I was a kid, I heard this story. It was of a group of boys in a Sunday school class. And the teacher said to the boys, uh, he put three crosses up on the board, and he asked these boys three simple questions. One was, who was the cross on the left-hand side for? And the boy said, that was for a thief. Who was the cross on the right-hand side for? That was for a thief. And then they said, who was the cross in the middle for? And they said, everybody knows that, that was for Jesus. He said, no, you're wrong. And they said, no, that was for Jesus. We know it was for Jesus. He said, no, it wasn't for Jesus. And then they said, well, who was it for? He said, that was for you and for me, but he took our place. You see, that's the message of, of Easter. It's the message of a Savior who took our place, took our sin, died for us so that we could be set free. Question number two, what did his death accomplish for us? What did his death accomplish? Just very quickly, it paid the price. His death had provided atonement for our sin. It opened the door to reconciliation with God. Because man is separated from God, but Jesus opened the door for reconciliation, that now I can have fellowship with God. The next verse in that chapter in Matthew that Pastor read tells us about the veil in the temple being rent in twain when Jesus died. You see, that was separating the holy of holies, and the people couldn't go in there, but the moment Jesus died, that was opened up so that we could have access into the presence of God, provided a way whereby sinful man could be justified before God. He guaranteed or provided a means that would guarantee for us the assurance of a home in heaven whenever we die. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to know what's going to happen after you die. That's one of the most wonderful blessings of being a Christian, that we can look ahead into eternity and we can know for sure we're going 
to heaven to be with him. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he has prepared a place for all those who trust in him. Now, an earthly king could never have accomplished all of that. Jesus, that day when he rode into Jerusalem, if he had to take a throne and sit upon a throne as an earthly king, he could never have accomplished all of this. But going to a cross, allowing him to be nailed there to that cross, dying as he did, he accomplished all of that for you and for me. What a glorious message the message of Easter is. What did his death accomplish? Well, we've looked at why it was necessary. Very briefly, what it was accomplished. And I just want quickly now to, to, to ask a question. How did people respond that first Easter? Well, we know, first of all, just to mention Judas. Judas betrayed him. That was his response. He had lived with him for three years, worked, listened to his teaching, saw his miracles, but he betrayed him. Peter, another one of the disciples, denied him. He actually cursed and swore and said, I never even knew him. The other ten, they all forsook him and they fled. What about the religious leaders of the day? I find it quite interesting as I look at this story of Easter that it was Pilate who wanted to set Jesus free and it was the religious leaders that wanted to crucify him. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that strange? Here's people who claim to worship God but they wanted to crucify Jesus. It's so sad, isn't it, that even in a church like Bethel there could be people who come to worship every Sunday, who read the Bible even and listen to the, the pastor preach, but who have rejected Jesus Christ and will not allow him to be their Lord and their Savior. The soldiers, of course, they mocked him. And then there was Two thieves on either side of him. One of the thieves berated him and said, if you are the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross and, and save yourself and save us? But the other thief, we read in the Bible how he believed him. He believed in Christ. And he cries out, Lord, remember me. He was willing to take Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior. Why was it necessary? Because of our sin and our separation from God. What does it, it do? What does the, the message of, the, of Easter, the message of Good Friday, do for us? It makes a, provides a means for us to be reunited and to have an assurance that we're child of God and on our way to heaven. The final question I just want to ask as we bring this service to a close today is this. What will you do with him? We've just briefly looked at what Judas did, what Peter did, what the ten did, what the religious leaders did, what the, the thieves did. But what will you do with Jesus? That's what Pilate asked, actually. He asked the people, what will I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And you know, we can listen to sermons we can sing hymns. We can claim to be as religious as we want to claim to be. But the big question, the all-important question is, what will you do with Jesus? The one who gave himself for you. You know, that day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and he stretched out his arms to welcome you to him. Remember what he said when he was alive? He said, come unto me, all you who will labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites us to come. One day Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and he cried out, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Wouldn't it be sad today on this Good Friday? if he was saying the same over you. He was saying, how often I have invited you to come, but you wouldn't come. 
There's a story that I heard a little while ago of a wedding feast that took place. The guests were all invited, and they came to the church. The organist played the organ. The ceremony took place, and after the ceremony, they all went to the hotel for the reception. As the guests entered the hotel for the reception, wedding reception, their names were checked off the list, and they were showed to their seats. The church organist came to the door, and uh, she wanted to go in, but her name was not on the list. And they said, you can't come. She said, but I'm the church organist. And they said, but your name is not on the list. She said, but I got an invitation to come. They said, your name is not on the list. And she was quite adamant that she should get in. And then they said to her, did you reply to the invitation? She said, no. And then they said, only those who replied to the invitation can come in. And friends, it's the same. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he hung on Calvary's cross, he was hanging there for you. And his invitation is to you today to come unto him and in him find forgiveness and salvation and peace and hope and an assurance of heaven. He provided it all for you. But if you don't come, it's not going to be of any use to you. The Bible tells us in Romans or Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. He's standing knocking at your door today. And if you've never come, I invite you to come and to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's here to be your Savior. He's here to be your Lord. And can I say, as we bring this little service to a close, if you've got questions, if you don't know Jesus Christ and you've got questions about this way of salvation and what he can do for you, how you can put your trust in him, do make contact with the church. Do contact us. We'd only be too happy to pray with you, to share with you, to, t uh, to share more with you. We've got a little booklet here that we love to give away, and it's entitled The Ultimate Questions, answering some of the questions as to how you can give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you would like one, just call up, and we'd be happy to send it to you. Uh, there's no obligation. We're, we're, we're here to help. And I just pray today that you will accept the invitation that Jesus gives to you. And that as we think of this wonderful occasion, Good Friday, we, it, it was awful in one sense, and yet it was good. Because on that day, Jesus Christ provided salvation for you and for me. But we must receive it. May God bless you. And we're going to pray just now. And if you have never asked Jesus into your life, you can do that even as we pray. Uh, and do make contact with us if we can be of help to you. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for the wonderful, wonderful message of Good Friday. We thank you for a Savior who was willing to leave the glory of heaven, willing to come this, to this earth, willing to suffer as he suffered, willing to die as he died, so that we could have salvation so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be uh, brought into fellowship with you. And Lord, we pray that this morning that you will apply your truth to our hearts and any who have never trusted you, that this will be a day when they'll come to know you as Savior and Lord. And bless all those who do and help us to live for your honor and for your glory. Thank you for your word now, Lord, and we pray that you will bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.